okay. and then start. Okay. All right. Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Pupwood Queen channel. This is Kathy's co-host for the evening, Tracy Lee Carnes, reminding everyone, if you uh, haven't, please go hit the subscribe button. That way you won't miss a minute of all the Pupwood Queen's lively discussions and videos right on the Pupwood Queen channel. And now the Pupwood Queen herself, Kathy Murphy. Hello. Hello, Tracy. Hello, everybody out there in movie land. Uh, tonight, we are going to be discussing one of the uh, most iconic films of this time is the 1983 film, The Big Chill, which had really an all-star cast. It has a very interesting take on how the movie was filmed. It was filmed in Beaufort, South Carolina, one of my favorite places in the world, the home of the Pat Conroy Literary Center. And I can remember Jonathan Hote taking Tawana Anderson, Neil and I around and showing us the home right there on the water, uh, you know, with all the salt grass and the beautiful views of the big plantation home where they filmed uh, a lot of this movie. So we have quite a cast and Tracy and I have been watching the film to kind of remind myself of the names of the characters. I've forgotten the names of them, but I did not forget the characters because we've got quite a few people that were um, involved in um, this film, everybody from William Hurt to Mary Kay Place to Jill Beth Williams to Jeff Goldberg to Tom Berenson. Uh, let's see who else. Um, Lynn Close else? was in it and Lynn Meg Tilly Close. played Chloe. Meg Tilly. It was uh, absolutely amazing. So, and Kevin um, Costner played Alex the Dead Guy. Yes, Kevin Costner. Actually, who who actually the guy in the cast. Yes, and it's ironic because of all the film stars that were in the film, the one that's probably had the longest lasting film career is uh, Kevin Costner, who played the classmate, the college friend that- All of his scenes out. And, and Lawrence Kasdan said that he would never ever do a director's cut adding him back in. He said, it's, it's a no-go. And what he did was he said, okay, I cut you out of this film. I will give you the lead in my next film, which was Silverado. And that's pretty much where Kevin wow, Costner really- I did not know that. That is fascinating to know. And I was, you were telling me before we started this show, this discussion about some of his other films and I had forgotten that he'd done all these other ones. And you mentioned, which ones to me, Tracy? He wrote Raiders of the Lost Ark. He wrote um, Empire Strikes Back. He wrote, a lot of your iconic movies, he's just a great, you know, to be honest, he was just a really great screenwriter. And I, you know, I, I think he's one of the best uh, storytellers out there. He can, every, he's very good at foreshadowing. And, and that is something that it's really big for me. I love foreshadow and play and, and pay off. And I can, you know, if I watch the film two or three times then I can start picking out, you know, what's foreshadowed and what's paid off. And when, um, when Harold, who's played by uh, Kevin Klein, uh, and Mary Kay Place is, is uh, plays Meg and she's in the house robe for the very first night. And he, he said, you know, he says something about, uh, Sarah has a robe just like that. And she says, not tonight, she doesn't. And Harold says, I always want to jump her when she's in that robe. That is one of the big foreshadows because the character of Meg wants a baby so bad. And she just, she's, she hates dating. She's just, she's not found the perfect man, but her clock is ticking. And she's decided she's going to have a baby and not have a husband or you know a significant other and back in the you know 83 it, it, you kind of you kind of wanted to get married at that right. time you know it's still what it, it even though they they would have graduated 
in like 1968, 69 from Michigan. And they were, they were considered radicals at the time. You know, they were, they were so full of, they weren't ambitious. They wanted to change the world. And what happened is in the course of them growing up and going and finding their careers, what, what happens is this big chill. And the big chill means that they, they, you know, they've cooled down. They're not so hot headed. They don't want to go out there and change everything. They're, they've, they've, they've become conservative and they've, they're now comfortable in their careers. Everybody but Nick and Alex. You know, everybody else seems to have a career going. Nick can't seem to get his act together, even though he he's already written his doctoral dissertation and he just he quits. Just like Alex. Alex quit quit his fellowship. And Nick and Alex, that character they kind of run run together in this film yes. and um but the big chill basically means they've just cooled off from you know what they're you know what what they thought about what they wanted to do in college and now they've just el grito strikes again they were a this was a little bit ahead of me and i can remember my uh, classmates, older brothers and sisters were of that era. And I watched them, they they all were, like you said, they wanted to change the world, but they became kind of yuppies. You know, they all they became- that, They were the epitome of yuppiedom back then. Um, you know, Harold's got this business, this running dog um, store, and it's actually a play on Mao Zedong's phrase, the running dogs of capitalism. So it, there's what? irony in that you know he's thinking of fortune off of this he is the ultimate capitalist making a fortune off of his his sporting good chain and that's not what he set out to do running dogs of capitalism i mean you just can't get more ironic than than that um uh uh mary Kay places character meg is an attorney she set out to basically represent the poor and downtrodden. And what she found out was they weren't worth saving. And <laughs> so she was, I mean, she says they were just repulsivos. And they, you know, those people were not worth saving. She realized they were scum. But she at when she was in college, that's what she wanted to save until she realized they weren't worth saving. And so she went to a law firm where she made the money. Yes. And, and, and Jeff Goldberg, Goldberg? Goldblum. Goldblum, I got, got it backwards. Jeff Goldblum works for People. And do you remember how hot People Magazine was at that time? Oh, I mean, God, yeah. People Magazine, everybody read. Exactly. You wanted to see who was on the cover. And I mean, you really, you could, you could glean everything in the grocery store aisle of it. You know, just by looking at the cover, reading the cover, you pretty much, you pretty much were caught up by the time you got up to the M&Ms and the conveyor belt, you know, at the grocery store. You know, how I crazy. don't see People magazine that much anymore. Do you? I do, but it's not the, it's oh. not the people, you know, at, at that time, people were just starting to really get caught up with celebrity again. It was fascinating, but it was interesting. And then he wants to start a club and then he's talking to his friend, goes, hey, who's, a, you know, become a big, you know, star. He said, maybe I want to, you know, get in on that. And I was just thinking, how interesting. I think it's every guy's dream to own a bar someday or a nightclub because classier than Elaine's. And I'm thinking, wow, this is pretty Elaine's nice. back in that day was it in New yeah. York. It really was. Yeah, but you know, and so you had, you had New York. So Jeff Goldblum's representing New York, and Sam Weber's representing everything Hollywood. You know, right. so they're kind of on the coast. And you know, Jeff Goldblum, who wanted, I think he his character wanted to be a good writer and you know, kind of write the the great American novel. 
and he's working for people. He's also pretty much all of the characters have have in their own way sold themselves to the devil, basically, of what they thought the devil was in college. Yes, because they had an ideal of what they were going to do. And then their their dreams and ideals got slammed with reality. And you know, like and, so that William think, character. Yeah, I think everybody that went to see this movie, I know when I saw it, I of course I think it has one of the most the best, one of the best soundtracks ever for a film, uh, by the way. But I think Our when film. I saw it, uh, the big conversation was who was Joe Beth Williams? Who was William Hurt? Who were the, who were the, you know, because everybody has the the golden girl in the class who everybody's just madly in love with or the, you know, the guy that's the it man. And it's interesting how, uh, it all played out. And this was a class that looked to me like they were all overachievers to begin with, which I actually was in a class like that. Every, I think we had the highest percentage of people go to college out of our class, like almost 90% of our class went to college out of high school, which is even today pretty unheard of. But um, it was you know, I, I actually can say that I went to school with a brain, now a brain surgeon and, you know, uh, uh, a filmmaker and a uh, pharmacist and, uh, you know, s school, uh, you know, leaders and teachers. And, and it's, it's fascinating to me how many of the, you know, and it doesn't happen with every generation, but this movie was iconic. And what was really unique about it is how they filmed this movie. Tracy, talk a little bit about how the director brought them all together to kind of live together for a while. That's so fascinating. It was very, it was at the time a little, a little ahead of its time, the way he did it. He brought them all together in Beaufort, South Carolina and, and, and Atlanta, Georgia, where they filmed everything. And he brought the cast together a month before shooting. They shot over 54 days. So a month before that, he got them all together. They would go, they would go eat together. They would work together. Sometimes they would even stay in character overnight and wake up the next morning still in character. I mean, they tried to live in these characters so that their dynamic of being best friends from college worked and I think that's why this movie works so well and why the characters mesh so well is because they time shoot principal photography started they knew each other and they knew each other very well I mean they literally were all all of them shoved in together they they had dinner parties you know, just together in character. So when you see they, that dinner party, it's they, it's it's very familiar. They kind of did that with Steel Magnolias when they filmed down in Natchitoches, Louisiana. They got all the stars houses. They all did dinners together and did everything together. And it what it does is it creates a cast that is invested in each other's success. And I mm -hmm. think it really shows, and it worked really well for Glenn Close because she got nominated for Best Supporting Actor at the Academy Awards and won. It was no, the writing. She didn't Never. win. I thought she won. No, she did not win. No, Big Chill did not win anything. It should have. But it did. It should have. It did win. Amazing. Glenn Close has never won an Academy Award. That's crazy. That's really, really, when you think about it, it's really crazy. Yeah, she's but like, didn't it, it's like a Susan Lucci of Oscars. Yeah. Didn't it win the Golden Globe for Best Picture, though? Didn't I read Maybe. that? Maybe. The Oscar, it got, it, it pretty much got overlooked. And, you know, oh, here's, here's something interesting, is that Lawrence Kasdan liked Beaufort, South Carolina, because he loved the look of the film. Get this, the great Santini. Oh, well, now we're talking my, you know, because Pat Conroy's body of work is yeah. my favorite, favorite author. And it's because 
it's storytelling at its finest. And you go to Beaufort and you're just living and breathing, you know, the, the whole low country, um, you know, feeling. And I know why Pat Conroy loved it there. And I understand why the director loved it there. And I'm going to bet that all the oh, actors God. loved it too. In fact, Kevin Klein's accent was fantastic uh, in the in the movie. He really caught that slow Southern gentleman. He, he did. And even the minister at the funeral, the way he spoke, it's, there's-, there's Where no did Alex's hope go? Where did it anytime, go? Anytime I hear that, that somebody say, where did your hope go? I immediately flash to that saying, anytime for all these years, almost 40 years, that line has stuck in my head. And I will sometimes utter it. Where did Tracy's hope go? <laughs> you know, I will, I will do you know, that occasionally. It's not funny because the guy committed suicide, but- <laughs> It's fun, but when you know when people know each other really well, we get a little bit distorted sense of humor. I mean, I can remember sitting with Pat Conroy and Doug Marlette and them telling stories, and their sense of humor is a little bit different than most because it's and I tend to be that way. I love humor that's not exactly politically correct. It's it's I don't know how to say it. they can take a very serious situation and make it very funny fast well, and then have you cry. Gallows, it's gallows humor yeah. and I love it it's my favorite it's my favorite form of humor because I guess you know like a lot of writers right writers can find humor in things that are not funny and they can, you know because you they do they're that listening. you're a good writer they're good listeners and you pick up on things that people say and I, you know, I'm kind of an eavesdropper when I go places, and I know you are too. Airports, the dollar store, I don't care where I go. If I hear something, you know, I'm immediately looking at the packaging kind of with my ear to the conversation. And I always am just, I think, oh my God, I've got to put this in a book someday because nobody would ever believe that could have been a real live conversation. Can you think of a time like that? You've heard, overheard something where you go oh, all the time no i I'll, i hear it all the time i've got i've got notes written on napkins and then i i bring them home and i'm like what the heck was i trying to tell myself well i i love to listen or in restaurants when you're in a booth you can hear the next people but i've caught people listening to me talk too so it works both well, ways. I've heard people going. Yeah, you know, know, that's like, why I think this movie works so well. It just, it captured at an interesting time. It, you know, it was, I was still in college when this came out. So it, it struck me in a way that when I saw it, I was, you know, I, I, I was a student. I was, what, a sophomore, junior in college. And it struck me, am I going to be there in my 30s? And I, I was. I bought, a, I bought a business when I was in my 30s. I owned a business. My husband, you know, I was married. I was trying to kind of eke out that yuppie life, own the house, you know, have a business and write. I was Wetter, trying to be a writer. Back, you know, the whole thing. Um, and you know, you know, was trying to be a yuppie, and you know, my 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 dynamic wasn't working. And it's really interesting. I was very miserable in my marriage. I think kind of Joe Beth Williams' character, Karen, is unhappy in her marriage, and she feels like she's missing out. And I felt like I was missing out, and I couldn't put my finger on what it was that I thought I was missing out on until interestingly enough HBO had this this brand new program on uh in in like 1998 and it was called Sex and the City oh, and yeah, that started cool. making my mind tick that you know what those girls are my age and they're out there single I might 
be missing out on some fun because I was not having, I, I was not having a good marriage. And I guess, you know, at that, that time, you know, I had kind of become Karen a little bit. I mean, I kind of identify with some of the characters. I identified with, with, with Meg, who's played by Mary Kay Place a lot, because she was the attorney, the very ambitious attorney. And that's what I had originally wanted to do. And I didn't. And I kind of became Alex for a little while of just roaming. And then I got married. And so then I became, you know, Karen a little bit, you know, with a marriage and, you know, kind of wanting that, that kind of life. And it wasn't working out for me. And I was miserable. And well, I, I think this is like the, the perfect movie when people are going to class reunions. The 10 year one is always tricky because yes. then everybody's very competitive and everything. But by the and time you do the, one, the ones I just had, the 45th and that, it's that's all over. You're just happy to be alive and that you're all coming together. But I think everybody that watches this show can relate at certain times to each of the characters. I didn't really see myself in any of them um, because I had gone back to college when this movie came out and I was having the time of my life because I was really into my art and that's what I've always wanted to do. And then ironically, I got married and moved to California for a while. So, uh, but I love the film, the soundtrack to me, when we watch part of it today again, all those songs brought back all those memories of that time period of when we're all just trying to find ourselves. And, and just like that film, when uh, we were 25, we lost uh, uh, a girl from our class to suicide. And it was very, uh, I'll never forget it. And all of us at the funeral together, because we've never been so shocked in our life, because this was one of the most popular girls that, uh, and I loved her. I mean, we went to church together and I've never been so shocked in my life, but I think anytime we have see a death at a young age, especially amongst our peers, it really affects us. And so uh, the writing of the film, the storyline, the I think it's universal in how people can relate to it because we can all kind of relate to it. And now those people are grandparents, you know, that of that era, these people are all, you know, it's their children are grown. You should be a grandparent. Now, I know I, you are a grandparent. I, you know, I am of the age where I should be right now. I should be a grandparent. I'm not because I chose to go down a different path and, 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 and I got divorced and that was it. You know, no more, I don't no kids. think, I don't think those rules even apply anymore because I nowadays so. I think it's important for people to watch this and to know that what is really important in life is that you find your bliss, you find your happiness and you, we were taught so much to go by these rules that are outdated. Uh, you know, my mother was a stay at home mom. You know, she was raised in the 50s, you know, 40s and 50s, and her parents were depression parents, so they were really hard scrabble, you know, they saved newspapers and rubber bands, you know, whatever, paper bags, whatever, but our generation was brought, or at least mine, was, it was so mixed, because we're seeing the kids ahead of us who are really making moves towards, you know, the 60s and civil rights and everything. And so we're taught with our parents' standards and then we've got the this other lifestyle like sex in the city. I mean, my gosh, if that had come out when I was in high school, I think everybody would have been in shock, you know, but Happy Days was a big show from um, high Mark school. And Mindy. And Mork and Mindy, all those shows. But um, if you were to think of one particular scene in the movie that affected you the most, which one would it be? Oh my gosh. Um, you could quote all the lines. So I, I always think that's yeah, amazing. You know, I mean, I think, you know, one of the most interesting parts of it was 
character of Chloe, who who's my age. And she she's been living with Alex and then he commits suicide. So then she sees a lot of Alex and Nick. And, and there is a lot of, of Nick and Alex are very parallel characters. And you see that when, um, and I think when they're out at the, at the farm, seeing where Alex and Chloe were fixing up this farmhouse. And she, she says, you remind me of Alex. And Nick turns around and goes, I ain't him. Yeah. But he is. And that always, I guess, you know, seeing that he, he is him. You know, as doing the videos, I always thought the videos were really funny when they were making their little videos. And he's talking about being this radio psycho uh, psychiatrist. And he talks about not finishing his doctoral thesis, just like Alex did not take the fellowship and he didn't live up to his potential. And Nick it wasn't living up to his potential as well. And so I just always found the Nick character um, interesting. I liked watching that dynamic unfold mainly because as you watch it you see he's he is Alex in a way right. and so when he says at that farmhouse I ain't him he really is yeah that's that's you know I think when know, I think gravity. back about that movie the thing that sticks in my mind the most is the music and them mm -hmm. dancing in the kitchen as they're, you know, getting everything ready for this meal. I just, it, it seemed so spontaneous and it seemed really like you were watching this story unfold. And I think that's because he had them all come together. He, and they, they were so comfortable together by, by the time they started filming that it really, I think had they not rehearsed this would not have been as good a movie. And I, and I, I have a hard time watching some movies now because I don't think they rehearse. I think the characters mesh well with each other. They just, they no cast chemistry. like, oh, Kevin Costner and I'll get, you know, I'll get Glenn Close and we'll just put them together and, you know, let's see what happens. It does, it, you know, you can't make a movie that way. You know, if you're trying to reflect real life, you, I, I think you need backstory, even though you may not, that's what method acting happens. When these actors do their homework and they create a backstory for a character, they may not use the information, but by the time they get it into their head, they know that character so well that it, it comes out in the script, even though that's not, nothing in that script talks about the backstory. They have made it up, but it gives that character a dynamic. And I think because we're talking about a, an ensemble cast of characters that were best friends through college, they couldn't have just come together, you know, for a week. They needed a month of every, living together every day for those characters to mesh so well. And I think that's why this movie resonates so well. And I think that's what's happened to movies. The movies today, really the story is not important. What becomes important is the tricks of the camera and the, all the you know things they do to do the special effects and everything. And half the time, there's not even any dialogue and I am of the feeling the best films ever made are the one when they do have dialogue and I I think about um To Kill a Mockingbird I think yes. about um gosh I'm just thinking about you know the is a is is one of those movies 
where it's just dialogue heavy. It, it's a play that, that that's, you know, on yeah, film. That's actually I mean, what you feel like you're so watching. dialogue driven and it's, and, but it works because, you know, I, I, I learning screenplay, the first thing they, they teach you is show, don't tell. But they're telling at this convention works and a lot of this dialogue in big chill it works it's it is telling but what you're doing is showing these characters that haven't seen each other in years right and they've all kind of gone their separate ways and they've come back but together they're talking about things that they've done and things that have happened but the show is how they've come back together but hasn't there been people in your life that you haven't seen in decades and then you get back together and you just pick up where you left off? I mean, I can remember one of my best friends in California. I didn't, I hadn't seen her. She got married, she had children, I had children. And I went back to Los Angeles for book expo and I called her up and we met and we just picked up right where we left off. It was the coolest thing. And uh, I just, it was just, you know, I'll never forget that night because we just, it's like we hadn't been apart and we've been apart for a long time, you know? So, uh, but it's magic when you get characters together like this and there's that uh, repartee and um, it was excellent. And I, I, I look forward to more movies where they use story and, you know, not so much, you know, I cannot handle one more, you know, comic book, Marvel, whatever thing. Yeah, either I think I've when you're younger, here. you want that action adventure. But when you get older, you want to you want to watch something that you can kind of relate to. And so, and the most people that it's watch interesting I are older now. I mean, the young people they're well, doing. I think other about it. I think about it a lot. I think you know, I'll I'll try to watch you know, one of these big tent pole movies, you know, Marvel movies. And I start, I get about 10 minutes in and I'm like, I can't watch this. And I think, <laughs> gosh, my 16 year old self, if she knew that I just could not sit through another Star Wars movie, I, my 16 year old self would not recognize me today. But then again, I am my 16 year old self because back, you know, this is going circling back. Lawrence Kasdan wrote those Star Wars movies and they had a really good story to them. Yeah. You know, I love the story. And now you get to these Marvel comics movies and these, these, Star, I just, I, I don't relate to it as well. I want, I, I want to be told a really good story. And that's what I related so much to The Big Chill. And I've probably seen it probably more than 50 times. And yeah. I, I love it. I can watch it. I, if it's on TV, I stop what I'm, it's one of those movies I stop what I'm doing and I watch it. I will think about it and I'll watch it. I probably, I, I probably maybe even have seen it a hundred times. I've watched I don't think it I've that, seen many, it that times. many times, but we I, talked about I, I, I watch it. movies break them down. Yeah, I know know. You. I'm a geek. <laughs> but I can tell but you I, there's been plenty of movies that I've watched so many times it's not even funny because every time I watch it, I see something new. And I'll tell you the movies though that get me the best, the ones that have the soundtracks. I we talked about Elizabeth Town. Oh my gosh, I can watch that. Probably I love Elizabeth Garden Town. State got me. Garden State soundtrack got me. And I remember I had a I had an iPod and I was from a movie at Sundance that just really shook me up a little bit. And I I, I told my buddy, I said, you know what? I think I kind of need to be alone right now. And he, yeah. he, he looked at me and he's like, I, right? I do too. And it, this was a movie we, it was just the weirdest kind of movie. And I, 
put my iPod on and I just kind of rode the tram around the city about two or three times trying to shake this movie off. And I, I was trying to shake it off to the soundtrack of Garden State, you know, cause it had just come out at the time. And I, you know, that kind of got me back centered was a, a movie soundtrack and the big chill soundtrack was two separate albums and because they couldn't clear the rights on certain songs for the first one and there was so much music in this and it's such a soundtrack driven uh movie that when i write i i make a soundtrack that's so I make the coolest thing a lot of authors do I, that American I, Graffiti is another one like that or Across the Universe. Oh my gosh, I can just really relate my, to those. My new, my new, uh, my new uh, book has a playlist and I would listen to it in the car while I was trying to think of stuff as I'm writing. And I wrote a lot of it while I was out in LA. And I had a lot of time on my hands sitting in my car. And I would think, and so, you know, I would think about certain scenes that I wanted and I made a playlist and I would put the earphones at five o'clock in the morning, sit and writing. And I would, you know, put the ear, earbuds on and I would write to that particular song. I, I like a playlist. And I thought the Big Chills playlist soundtrack was probably one of the best soundtrack albums ever recorded. I, I can only name a handful of those albums. I think um, American Graffiti. Yep. One of, probably was the first real soundtrack I ever bought. It had two when albums. I was, it was a two albums. It, was, it, opened, it opened up and I remember yeah. opening it up and I just, I loved it. I really got into that music. I loved that. I bought Star Wars and I thought that was just an, an interesting soundtrack. Um, Big Chill in college, I bought both of those albums. Um, and then Garden State was pr has probably been in Elizabethtown. For Elizabethtown maybe. is like, I want to go on that drive with that, you know, with that eight track yeah. tape and just play it everywhere, like in the movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you've got to watch it. But there's, there's, it's, you know, each film has its own unique um, stamp on it. But this is one that really, like oh brother where art thou the music helped define exactly. the movie and oh brother where and art thou I and still Tim, when when michael goes goes downstairs to where chloe lives and where chloe and alex had lived and he's just i'm just checking on you and she's like thanks and then it plays i know something about love and they're all kind of everything is leading you know love is everything's starting. yeah and you know all of the all of the songs kind of fit that particular scene in the movie you know especially the you know you cannot you, you know you cannot listen to um the rolling stones you can't always get what you want without thinking about right. that movie it's so Absolutely. iconic and that I, is the most iconic song of that, you know, of the movie. And, you know, Heard It Through the Grapevine, I guess it's the second song. But yeah. anything it, that's going to get some Motown in there, I'm going to love. And I oh, actually, yeah. I think about, um, you know, I, everybody knows I'm a Shah Rukh Khan fan. And, but it's the music that drives the story and they're ex the Indian filmmakers are great storytellers, but the music drives the story too. So I think of Om Shanti Om, I think of Ra One, I think of, oh my gosh, the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life are the, you know, uh, from some of those movies and they just haunt me. And that's what the songs from this show did. So 
We're hoping that everybody. I, that's why I make a playlist for everything. My life, I can do. I can list. I can look at my my iTunes. My iTunes. I probably have over twenty five hundred songs in my in, on my phone, and they all define certain my moods at certain times over over the course of of 20 odd years i those songs define certain moments you know they're of like, my life they're like foods you know certain foods can trigger memories and scents so when you hear a certain song you're all all of a sudden exactly back in that place when i hear smoke on the water I'm driving with my <laughs> classmates to the lake. I mean, we're going swimming, we're going tanning, you know, we're gonna get ready for the big night out. But smoke I, on the water. Driving in, in Dave Sanders' van, playing smoke on water. And he was white, his dad's um, Bacardi 151. And we would all go get, get our canned Cokes and, you know, drink enough of it so he could pour the 151 in it i don't know if his dad ever caught him or not he just always had the 151 and you know that van driving around smoke on the water that song triggers that particular memory to me absolutely well for Hot everybody guys. watching um tonight like i hope you'll watch the big chill this is the 39th years so next year it's gonna be 40 years since this movie came out and i just especially for the younger people i just want you to recognize that these were you know probably now some of your grandparents you know but it's uh, there's a a picture of all these girls in bell bottoms and skin tight you know halter tops and stuff standing they say, oh, these women were are now your grandmothers and i just yeah. think we forget that people were younger and we it's a wonderful way through music to learn about other generations i love movies based upon um like elvis or queen or anything that's to do with you know anything that's got a lot of music involved because oh, it's, I do too they're kind of nostalgic for us. So um, watch The Big Chill, and I'm sure they're gonna be doing a lot of things when the 40th anniversary comes up. And uh, if you ever get a chance to go to Beaufort, South Carolina, the house is right there on the main main drag, and it's worth seeing. Um, any last comments you wanna make about the show, Tracy? I just, um, you know, it was a different time. It was a, it was, it was a time before, right before cell phones, you know, cell phones started coming out in about 88, 89. So this is 1983. You know, to me, I was starting to come of, of that age, you know, by 1987, you know, I was out, you know, dating and going out and, and, and trying to become a yuppie. And, um, I, it was an innocent, it was a different time. We, we, it was slower. It was just different. You know, now everything's so fast paced. We're on our phones constantly and we're not in the moment. I, it, we, we're not in the moment. I think sometimes you've just got to put the phone down. Absolutely. Just, you know, How in the friends. world did we ever be with you? your friends? These are the people that are going to be there for the rest of your life from college. Be, be there. Be, you present. know, in be present. in the moment. Drop the phone. You do not need to record the concert. Enjoy the concert enjoy being with your friends because once those those moments are gone they're gone be in the moment it's just like if you live in the present it's a gift and it's a it's gift. Gift that, yeah it's a gift a present is a gift so um do that and and the the less i'm on social media and the phone I'm finding the happier I get. So it's really nice to go someplace that doesn't have Wi-Fi for a while. So, and I haven't had it. 
I haven't, I don't have it half the time at my house because of the weather. And it's, I'm going to change my password so you can't get on. <laughs> right. Well, no. thank you for joining us. And we meet uh, the first Sunday of every month for the Book and Film Club. We meet the last Sunday of every month for the Shah Rukh Khan, um, the Pulpit Queen Shah Rukh Khan Friends and Film Club. And we are getting really excited about our up and coming Girlfriend Weekend book club convention in Amelia Island, Florida. So go to the YouTube channel and subscribe because we've got a wonderful new updated video on everything to do with our big convention. You need to get your tickets now because it'll be here before yeah, you know it. It's and going to be fun. It's Lots really going to be fun. It's a staycation vacation right in the same type of place that um you know we're going to be out there on the east coast so um uh love thank it. you for joining us we love your comments please watch the films i'm posting them on our our website www.thepulpwithqueens.com and i'll be posting soon our next pick and tracy and i'll be talking about which one we want to do but um in the meantime, just go to the calendar of events. You can see everything. Oh, and before we go, uh, November 12th at 11 o'clock, correct? We're going to be uh, doing uh, a Zoom with Tracy is going to be our uh, author screenwriter who's going to be doing our writers club. So I'll be getting that up on the website this week. That's this coming Saturday at 12 noon. And uh, please join us because I learned so much from all the writers and, and people that work on their books from our writers club. And we'll be uh, getting that book going. And I'm sure Tracy's going to be talking about her new book, The Darlings of Sundance and how we're going to the Sundance Film Festival. So if you've ever wanted to take your book to film, join us next Saturday with Tracy Collins. Okay. All right. All right. It's all about the story and we'll see you at the movies. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. See you. Thank Bye -bye. you, Tracy. Bye-bye.